Research Associate here at the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds. We're going to do something a little bit different for the session leading into lunch. Um, many of you are eligible for fellowships to fund your research, or will be soon. And so it might be interesting for you to see or get some advice from um, people who have written successful proposals for fellowships. And so we're delighted to have you here today. Um, James Owen is a Hubble Fellow. Um, Dan Coleman Mackey is the Sagan Fellow. Uh, Brian Hicks is a NASA postdoctoral program, NASA postdoctoral program fellow, and Laura Kreiberg is an NSF graduate research fellow. And they're going to give us advice on how to write a successful um, proposal and um, give them a warm welcome. Um, <laughs> ask them lots of questions. Um, there's going to be plenty of time for questions, and also. This is leading into lunch. At lunchtime, they're going to sort of split up um, by table. And so if you want to follow up and ask them more questions and you've got a particular fellow, fellowship you're interested in, join them for lunch and ask them more about um, how they wrote a successful proposal to get their research funded. So, um, James, um, do we have your back? Yep, we're good. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we know we're standing between uh, your lunch and early start. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, organising committee for asking us to give this talk. Um, so I'll just start off with uh, who we are and uh, where we've come from. So uh, Daniel Foreman Mackey is uh, sort of uh, was slash is a PhD student at NYU. He's sort of in this arrow here, and he's becoming a Sigma Fellow at the University of Washington. Uh, Brian Hicks, he did his PhD at uh, uh, BU, he was a Senate postdoc at UMass, and now he's an NPP fellow at the Goddard Space uh, Science Center, or a fellow, uh, is a NSF uh, graduate student fellow at the University of Chicago, and uh, myself, Jay Turn, I came through Cambridge, CETA, and now I'm a Hubble Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study. So, um, we're going to have a, an outline here, and it's sort of, a, it's going to be fairly informal, so, um, if you, you want to interrupt us, please do. Um, we're going to go through some general background, and we're going to talk about the specifics of the, the fellowships we're going to represent. Um, we're going to discuss what we and others think that might be good proposal writing technique. Um, this is perhaps my favorite part of the talk. I have solicited, or we have solicited advice from people we know who have been on the selection panels, and under the condition of Anonymity, we have asked them for advice. Um, it's amazing what they'll say under that condition. <laughs> uh, and then we can have uh, a more detailed Q&A and you can interrogate us at lunch. So um, I'm going to hand over to Lauren. She's going to tell us a little bit about uh, fellowships for uh, grad students. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh,
the application is kind of involved. You have to write a personal statement um, as well. I think it may have changed since I did it. Um, so right, you have to you have to write one statement talking about what you um, what you have done and what your background is, and another about your research plans and goals and the usual letters of rec. And the proposals are evaluated based on two main areas. One of them is intellectual merit, so basically how strong of a proposal you've written, and also you're evaluated on your undergraduate record. This is probably the last time that your undergraduate grades will actually matter. Um, and the proposals are also evaluated based on broader impacts, and so some examples of the broader impact criteria are um, presenting your research to the public, engaging in all kinds of outreach. There, the, what counts is broader impact is a fairly broad category. Um, and you're also not beholden to <coughs> carry out the broader impacts that you say you will um, in your proposal. And so I ended up, I, I think I said that I was going to start a women in science mentoring group, and then someone else actually did that before I got around to it. And so instead, for broader impacts, what I did was make some YouTube videos about my research results. Um, and that also counts. So once you get one of these fellowships, you have it, it's a three-year award, and you spread out, you can spread it out over five years in total. And you're also eligible for some additional perks. One of them is the NSF Grow program, and at least one person in Caleb Henderson did this, so talk to him if you're curious. It, it allows you to um, carry out a research project in a foreign country. Um, and there's also a, a new thing called GRIP, which is places you in, um, I think, at national labs or industry types of jobs if you want to go in that direction. Um, okay, that's what I've got for Anita. Some more general information about uh, postdocs versus fellowships before I talk about the, uh, the NPP. Uh, so um, there are a couple of uh, distinctions I suppose you could make uh, if you want to uh, distinguishing postdocs, uh, general postdocs, where you just go to some university and you know, find some professor that does something similar to what you work on, or maybe something different that you want to change into, uh, versus a fellowship where you uh, uh, there's an opportunity that maybe is a, a more. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Engineer. <laughs> All right. Uh, so there we go. Okay. So so a fellowship might be uh, more prestigious. There's also uh, it's kind of a it's a fine line as well between a fellowship and a postdoc. Uh, I'm I'm a postdoctoral fellow fellow at, at NASA, and uh, uh, this, I'll, I'll get to the, the NASA stuff uh, in a couple of slides. Um, the the cons to a fellowship might be that you're you're kind of on your own here. Uh, or, or uh, you don't have uh, direction you have in a, a structured group uh, uh, where, where uh, there's, there's an already uh, path that's predefined and maybe you're fulfilling the, the role that, that needs to be uh, 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 filled. Um, so, let's see. Um, so with the, the open versus institutional fellowships, an open institution or an open fellowship is something where you, you can award like the Sagan or the uh, Hubble and, uh, uh, or, or Einstein, uh, and, and can kind of take it anywhere. Uh, with the caveat being that you, you tend to talk to someone first with with an idea of where you might like to go. Um, so it's sort of sort of open, but uh, for the most part, you can go where you'd like to. Um, <clears throat> whereas an, an institutional fellowship is, is one where it's, it's sponsored, it's, it's directly associated with some institution, some university, some some uh, uh, research facility. Um, so uh, here's here's a list of some of the uh, fellowships uh, available uh, across the world, I guess. Um, and, and many of these are new to me, so I can't speak to a lot of them. Um, but uh, I guess the point here is that uh, uh, you know you don't have to look just in the U.S. You can, you can look elsewhere. Uh, it might also be closed off um, depending on what the, the, the fellowship is. You might not be uh, eligible for for some fellowships. Uh, James was telling me that this one, uh, for instance, here is for for EU citizens who would like to go and work with another EU. Uh, country. So um, I think all these slides will be available so you can, you can look uh, 
at these later if they're, if they're new to you, and you can uh, uh, follow up and, and uh, look into uh, possibilities where you might like to go. Um, so institutional fellowships are, are some of them are listed here, um, mm -hmm. and uh, again these slides are available, so uh, I won't just list them off here, but uh, uh, you, you can uh, look into these on, at, uh, at, at, in your own time. Um, so things to keep in mind when you're when you start applying to fellowships are, are uh, I guess, who's your competition? Uh, how many of us are, are there out there? Uh, so these are some of the numbers taken from I, I think uh, uh, NSF reports. Uh, yes, uh, so here's the website where this is taken from. So 303 astronomy and astrophysics PhDs in 2013. Uh, I'm, I'm not in that number there, so there are others uh, that, that will be you know, looking to get these positions too. Um, so there, there are this, these sort of numbers of available positions that you're, you can apply to. Uh, open fellowships, there are 35, 40, uh, about 30 institutional. I guess these are all uh, numbers taken from some, summarizing what were on the last couple of slides. Uh, and then uh, 100 fellowships uh, available internationally. So, so 100 available versus the 300 in the U.S. Uh, alone. Uh, so that's that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so speaking to the uh, NASA postdoctoral program uh, fellowship that I've, I've got, uh, so uh, the purpose of this is primarily to uh, get you into a, a, a NASA facility where you can do research um, with uh, experts working at, at, at NASA. Um, so the uh, uh, no, the contract here is pretty poor. Um, so I'll have to read this off here. Again, it'll be, it'll be, be available on the slides elsewhere. A um, couple of key points of the NASA postdoctoral program uh, is that uh, you, you've got a few different opportunities for uh, proposing, uh, which is different from a lot of other opportunities. So they're, they're uh, around in, in March, July, and November 1st are our due dates for uh, uh, opportunities that you want to propose to. Um, this, I guess, here is a, is a NASA postdoctoral program fellow doing something that NASA postdoctoral program fellows do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these, are, these are some of the numbers uh, uh, over the past few years here. Of, uh, uh, that are in the program. So uh, a few years ago, 208, uh, and then uh, this year, two, 209. So the numbers are pretty steady here. Um, the stipends are, are uh, pretty good. Uh, this The starting stipend is uh, something like 53K. Uh, you, you get a relocation allowance, which is nice. Um, you get a travel budget of 88K, which is uh, uh, nice. So that, that gets you to a few conferences per year. Um, also got all the uh, health insurance, and, and uh, the duration is, is uh, two to three years. Uh, the third year is actually conditional on finding funding, so that's, that's something important to keep in mind. That the, the first two years are kind of guaranteed if you get selected. Uh, third year, uh, it's up to you and your advisor to, to uh, make sure that there's, there's money for a third year should you choose to uh, pursue one. Uh, so here's the, here's the uh, uh, website when I go to, to uh, look into all this. This is, this is just a postcard taken from that website. Uh, and here's one of the pages uh, from that website here showing some of the numbers. If you uh, search for X minus, these are all the opportunities you can uh, select by uh, a facility. Um, so uh, here's Goddard, uh, here's uh, JPL is up here, uh, a couple of the, the facilities, a few exoplanet stuff, Ames is another one. Um, anyway, uh, if you search for uh, exoplanets uh, in the open uh, positions that are available, that are advertised uh, by NASA scientists, uh, there are something like 736 here as of uh, a couple of weeks ago, 736 total opportunities. Uh, 17 of those are, are uh, listed here when you search for exoplanets. Um, so this is summarizing uh, a few of the uh, facilities that are, are doing exoplanet research. Like I said, Ames, Goddard, and JPL um, are pretty heavily uh, involved with uh, instrumentation development, which is primarily what I, I do, actually. Um, and uh, Ames also is doing instrumentation <coughs> Um, and and there are uh, also there's the uh, let's see the uh, exoplanet program offices at JPL um, and uh, uh, yes uh, there are these other centers here too all, all uh, possibilities for places where you can uh, branch out or, or uh, I think also there there are a few that have uh, exoplanet related stuff going on um, there's also the astrobiology program um, and and there are a couple of other opportunities through uh, NPP where you can be uh, also a senior NPP if you've had your uh, PhD for five years or more. Uh, there's, there's another category. There's also one where it's uh, a management position. So there's a, there's a management specific 
uh, uh, postdoc where you, if you, if you like to get involved with, with program uh, oversight and that sort of thing, uh, that's available to you. Um, uh, again, sorry for the contrast, but the uh, main point for, for uh, I, would, I would like to, uh, or a piece of advice I'd, I'd offer is that you communicate directly with your advisor. Once, you, once you've gone through uh, the list of opportunities and isolated a couple that you're interested in, definitely contact uh, uh, them directly if they haven't actually contacted you already, uh, which can happen too. Um, so you know, just, you know, some of the uh, general rules that apply to most uh, uh, applications where you've got uh, kind of an outline of what your uh, 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 proposal will look like. And uh, yeah, uh, you want to follow the instructions carefully uh, and, and make sure you don't, you don't miss anything, uh, just like when you're uh, proposing to any other uh, research office you want to find. All right, so now I'm supposed to talk about uh, the Sagan and the Hubble, because um, they're pretty similar, um, and so I'm, I'm covering both. It's, uh, it's really awful to be here. It's bringing back all sorts of terrible memories from last <laughs> fall, um, so thanks for that, you guys. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't have a whole lot to add. Uh, after what we've heard, we'll get on to the fun stuff, um, but uh, just like a few of the uh, technical details. So uh, the Sagan Fellowship, of course, is uh, just for exoplanets and, and related things, and Hubble's for all the things. Um, and uh, might as well apply for both of them. Uh, the, the perks all look pretty much the same. Uh, the details for both of these, are, they're in basically the same program. So um, uh, you, you have to be positioned, that you, you apply with a specific US institution in mind. Um, the duration is up to three years if you aren't terrible and if NASA doesn't go under. Um, <laughs> the salary is good, you have health insurance, that's important in this country. Um, and uh, a good research travel budget, that kind of, it's, uh, it seems like a pretty sweet ride. I'm starting in a few weeks, so I, I actually don't know how much of a sweet ride it is, but it sounds very nice. Um, so the, the applications are very similar, um, and similar to all the other things, um, but uh, one difference that's important uh, to, to point out is that um, for the, the research proposal, um, the, the the Hubble research proposal is three pages plus figures and references, two pages of figures and references, and the Sagan is shorter. It's three pages including figures and references. So it's worth starting with the Hubble and then editing it down so that your Sagan will be much better. Um, that's why I ended up with the Sagan. Uh, 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 and yes, again, you have to contact a specific uh, contact at, at the institution that you're proposing to uh, work at. And, uh, and they have to endorse your proposal, but you know, people like free money and postdocs and stuff, so that's not too hard. Um, uh, oh yeah, about, um, I don't really remember what was on here, but, um, oh yeah, so, so there's always political choices about which institutions you decide to apply to, and everyone has conflicting ideas about what you should do, um, and so don't listen to any of those things, I guess. Um, uh, but the thing that's important is that each institution can only accept one Hubble and one Sagan per year. And so when it comes to the competition, that's something to think about, I guess. Um, and oh yeah, this was the last thing. This was the only slide that I made that made it onto here. I like mm -hmm. big fonts. Um, the, these are very competitive. The acceptance this year was 17 to 1. Um, uh, there are fewer Sagan fellowships and fewer proposals, so they're both about exactly as competitive. Um, and that's brutal. Um, that's all I wanted to say about this. Thanks. Um, so let's, let's get down to the, the nitty gritty and um, what you might want to think about doing. So uh, luckily, in, in astronomy, for the, for the, the major major uh, fellowships and job applications, they tend to fall, follow the, the same format unless you apply to one of the sort of more obscure ones we had on our list. Uh, all tend to want a CV, uh, general advice is keep it clean, about two pages. Um, they want a list of uh, publications, don't list 50 pages, papers you have in preparation. Um, the rule I would say is if you really want to put an in prep paper on it, uh, put a paper that you'd be happy to email someone to the, the day you send them your list of publications. Um, they'll want a research proposal, so what you want to do, 
Uh, things like the Sagan, Hubble, and Einstein on a research statement, so that's what you've done. Um, you might want to link these two or think about how you link these two. And they'll often ask for reference letters. Uh, most places ask for free nowadays, so uh, when you ask for the reference letters, <laughs> send them the application. Uh, and also think carefully about who you want your, might want your reference letter writers to be. And probably another important point is it takes time, unfortunately. It takes a lot of time. So you need to set aside <coughs> some time to do this. It can take up to months, so you might want to start thinking about this now if you're applying uh, this fall. So the, the basics for the proposal is um, it may be one of the most important parts of the application, so this is the part, part where you want to spend the most time. Um, read the rules carefully, uh, don't break them or even bend them. Um, if you're on the panel and you've got 100 proposals to read and someone uses half a font that's smaller than everyone else, they're going to note it. Um, another important point for those uh, US-based people um, or European-based people, if you send your application to a different uh, area, make sure you uh, format it on the correct size paper, otherwise you, you might have your most important sent -off sentence cut off by a printer. And uh, know your audience, so don't submit the same proposal to 10 fellowships. Modify it slightly for each individual fellowship to try and get that uh, aim across. Um, so what is the proposal? So the proposal is uh, what you want to do, essentially, and you want to fit that within the fellowship aim. So if you were applying for a, a Hubble, say, you might want uh, a sentence at the top explaining why exoplanets is important to modern astronomy. But if you're applying for the Sagan, well, you probably don't need that because the panel might agree with you that exoplanets are important. So you might want to describe instead why the area you're interested in is important to exoplanets. So you want a decent project and what, what it's going to provide. What new data will you provide? What problem will you solve? And this is another important point is uh, some of us think as a collection we're all intelligent people, so some other people might have similar ideas to you. So why are you the best person to carry out this idea rather than the other person who has the same idea as you? So what you want to describe is you want your project to try, this is what sort of the, the fellowship panel's like, this is what you'll see on my anonymous comments, is you want your project to be new and interesting and not a continuation of your previous work. I want to try and identify a niche in which you're ideally placed to push forward in. You should have clear goals in mind and think how they might impact other areas. And the project should be achievable. Don't sort of come up with some crazy idea that's never going to happen but sounds awesome. You might want to, if you're applying for one of these open fellowships or and the institutional fellowships, what, why, should, uh, why should they take you? Uh, is it for access to data, access to resources? There are certain people there. Why is the project timely? Why should it be done now and not in five years' time when there's better data available? Again, you should start thinking about it a long time. Talk to others about it. Uh, your advisors, colleagues, other students, conference attendees, for example, and get feedback early on your project ideas before you start writing. So getting down to how you might write this, this is a, another important point. Proposals are not academic papers, so they should not read like that. And basically the two points you want to keep in mind is you are uh, sort of publicizing two things. You're publicizing the project, why is the project important, and why you are important as well. Why are you the best person to do um, You also want to be clear, concise, uh, use figures, that's very important. And also this is another thing. Remember, reviewers can read hundreds of applications, make yours stand out. For example, for the Hubble, last year there were 265 applications. So that's thousands of size of paper that the panel had to read. So you need to think about that. Um, getting feedback is another very important uh, uh, point when writing the application, oh, when you finish writing it. Uh, send it to referees uh, so they can write something like, I believe Dan is... Dan's project on uh, exoplanets is timely because exoplanets are cool at the moment and he's the best person to complete it, for example. Um, send it to your colleagues, advisors, other interested parties. Remember, they don't have to be in your field to give good feedback. A lot of the fellowships you might think of applying for are not just exoplanet focused, so they should be able to understand it and understand why it's important. Uh, 
Another thing is offer to read other people's proposals. You'll get some good hints of what you think people are doing well and what people are uh, doing badly from doing this, and you might learn something as well, which is always a good thing. Uh, and leave time for this. Uh, no one's going to give you good feedback one day before the deadline. If you ask them for a couple of weeks, then you may give good feedback. So um, I've been brave enough to throw up my own proposal here, and uh, unlike Laura's uh, statement that all sides that end with a question mark are likely to say no, <laughs> you can't disagree. Um, so uh, it's successful in the fact that I got the, uh, got the fellowship, but it doesn't mean it's successful in the fact that it's good. Uh, so things that people th seem to think that are uh, good about this is uh, I have a very clear descriptive title characterizing the initial planet population, Everyone here should understand what I'm going to describe in the text. Um, I've stuck a main aim here, sort of a, a summary of what this title is. And so, if you're feeling a bit tired, you don't have to read this. You can just read this. <laughs> I've used an illustrative figure which I've referenced in my text. And another important thing that you you want to do is you want to reference your own work. Why, why, what I have done is important to the project I'm proposing, and you can emphasise that with referencing your own. Work. So on to the fun stuff. Um, so I solicited, or we solicited, uh, a few uh, people who we've known who've been on these panels many, many times for some advice, and we sort of uh, removed the swear words and uh, uh, ranting and tried to get it down to some sort of convincing, useful advice. So this is the, the main thing. This is the important point. For me, a convincing research proposal is not one that promises more of the same, but uses innovative work in the past as a launching point for interesting exploration. That's what I've been saying. You don't, you don't want to sort of propose what you've been doing. You want to propose why you, what you've been doing is uh, interesting to some new research. Uh, this is sort of a don't piss off the panel statement. Uh, don't use too many uh, acronyms. Don't tell the panel how awesome you are. Uh, that should shine through, apparently. The panel is busy. Obviously, it's got tons of things to read, several thousands of sheets of paper. They will be very, very easily annoyed by several things. Uh, if you write too specialized, panel won't understand it, if you write it too basic, the panel will be insulted, um, and do the, do the basic things right, follow the rules, um, also be very sparing with the much overworked, uh, overworked unique adjective, um, if you were clever, you would have seen unique in my uh, proposal, so <laughs> don't take this one too seriously, um, and it should make sense in particular given the candidate's past history, so don't say, oh, I've been working on Kepler exoplanet statistics, I fancy a crack at quantum gravity now, for example. <laughs> uh, this is a statement about letters. Uh, it's often hard as a uh, young researcher to decide or find enough people to uh, write letters. So, um, this is some good advice. Uh, ideally good to have a, a range, an observer, a theorist, and if possible, someone from a different university. Um, some advice I was given as a, as a graduate student was if, if you're struggling to find three, uh, rep, uh, three letter writers, a uh, useful resource it might be try and find out someone who's given you a good referees report, a good detailed referees report on your paper. They may be in a good place to write a decent reference back. Um, and again, emphasize why uh, what you've done in the past is the right place to put you in. Uh, Project and I'll leave uh, with probably what was, was my uh, favourite comment of all the ones I was sent, which was this: a very, at the very least, the proposal needs not to be irritated. <laughs> so um, we'll take questions. Uh, thank you very much. Hope, hopefully, it's been useful. ask a referee to write it, but what are the panel people looking for in a reference letter that a person who has refereed your work could actually write you a letter for? Like, are they looking for your ability as a researcher or the quality of your work? The importance of your work? Yeah, I, the importance of your work. On a show. So, yeah. <laughs> The importance of your work, they can, they can place it in context of the general field. Uh, it looks good to a panel to have someone from outside 
what a reference letter. I mean, these are, these are ideas if you're struggling to find uh, free reference letters, this is a, a good idea that I thought was interesting. I've got a question. Uh, Laura, you mentioned you have to be a US citizen to get the NSF fellowship. Right. Is that true of all the fellowships? Uh, what sort of immigration statuses would you even eligibility for all of them? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know on a case-by-case basis, so you have to look. Um, there's like the Hertz Fellowship, which may be open to everyone. Um, and, but yeah, the NSF and NASA grad student fellowships are only for US citizens. Well, actually, <coughs> there's an NESSF, which is open to all. Which one? Okay. Yeah, there's there's also one that NASA uh, search for opportunities page. There's a little tick box for open to uh, uh, anybody non US citizens. And uh, Hubble and Sagan and those are open to anyone. I'm Canadian, so they let me in. Okay. Um, Brian, I thought you made a very good point that with the fellowship, the postdoc fellowships, that you're often sort of unsupervised. Uh, and I wonder if you guys could just talk about sort of the calculus there of whether or not it's better to sort of get the supervision at a grad school or whether or not the prestige of getting one of the fellowships outweighs the potential for sort of losing yourself and, and that. Well, I guess since you addressed me, I'll, I'll take the first crack at that. But I, I think everybody's experience there is probably pretty unique. Um, I, I've actually had an interesting experience where uh, my, my advisor was on sick leave for a couple of months and so someone else had to come, come and step in to help out with uh, signatures since my signature doesn't go very far in NASA. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, but the, the, the guidance thing is, is uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, a question for yourself, I think. Uh, the, uh, if, you're, if you're kind of an outgoing person, uh, you might do well actually to uh, be uh, you know, more independent and uh, kind of strike out on your own. Uh, if you tend to be a little bit more introverted, I think it might, you know, in some cases it might, it might work to have a, a little more stru structure or someone that can kind of uh, represent for you. And so communicating that sort of thing is probably not a bad idea with your uh, advisor, uh, kind of getting a sense of that. If you don't want to do it directly, uh, you can probably figure out a way to, to do that. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that's it's a personal choice. So. If you feel that you, you've got a, a good research program that you think you want to do and um, you're fairly self-motivated, then a fellowship looks great because you're going to get it. That looks good to some people and you're also going to do well in it. But if, you're, uh, if you might feel that you don't really know what you want to do, um, then you're likely to do better scientifically if you go for a, um, a postdoc with a supervisor who has a, a well-defined project clear publications out of that, um, and then that could be a better launching point. It's, it's, I mean, getting a fellowship is not a, a, the be-all and the end-all, it's, it's really a personal choice um, to, as to how you like to work. If you like to work in a big, big team on specific projects with a well-defined uh, direction, then go for it. Um, you, could, you can contact that person directly and say, look, I'd like to think about applying for a fellowship on your project. What do you think of this? And they might say, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, go ahead for it. They might say, I don't like that. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get what you don't ask. Um, so for the NPC, you're, right, you're selecting from a list of uh, options on websites. Um, how much freedom do you have to define your own projects? Or are you picking a project that's already defined for you from that list? Um, it's a good question. So, you know, I've, I've been through one, one proposal um, and, and only had that. Uh, there are other NDPs, uh, uh, sorry, if you're at Goddard, and there, there are something like 40, 40 at, at Goddard, so uh, contact the NDPs uh, uh, to get uh, more, more than what I can offer um, would, would probably be a good idea. Uh, but uh, I, I think that also if you if you know someone that you work with, say, as a graduate student uh, at NASA, uh, chances are you could probably uh, make a suggestion that they, they uh, just add an opportunity if there's not already one. Uh, listed there. Uh, I think I think uh, you know, taking an initiative, uh, taking an initiative and, and expressing uh, interest in doing something like that uh, would, would would go a long way. 
uh, I, I can say from personal experience, uh, finding help to, to uh, push projects forward that, that uh, uh, need help. Uh, you, you can find yourself stressed a little bit at times. Uh, uh, that can also be advertising, I guess, for anybody that's uh, interested in uh, my talk tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, there's, there's definitely uh, opportunities there for people that are, are uh, willing. Yeah, so let's say there's someone that has applied for some of these and not been successful. Are there any thoughts on resubmitting uh, the same project but tweak, you know, the other comments? Uh, nobody's been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm also MVP like Brian, and uh, I did it a couple of times. <laughs> so that's actually something I would recommend, is that especially for the MVP, you get really nice reviews. How many postdocs are, are there in here? How many are grad students? And, and 
how many other uh, uh, MPP second in, in uh, have we heard from everybody else? Second in the level? Okay. Maybe we should all get together at our respective tables. <laughs> well, hopefully there's one per table. Yeah. I've got another question about the MPP. The proposal is significantly longer than it is for the second level. How does that change the writing style? Uh, yes, yes, it is. It is longer. It's, it's uh, I, if I recall, it's, it's I think 15 pages. Um, so, which is actually about the same length as a, uh, uh, I guess, a, an inspired proposal uh, or a lot of opportunity. So, um, it wasn't my first uh, time proposing that, that sort of format, and I suppose uh, would be the first for a, a, a lot of others. So, um, I actually, but that, that I think can be a little bit easier when it's in it, when it's longer. It's, it can be hard to, uh, so you know, hats off to you guys to so you know, cram. Uh, a good proposal into two or three pages. Um, so, so the um, I think it's actually I, I wouldn't say that I, I had to change anything. Um, I, I, I hadn't I didn't have to change anything because I hadn't uh, applied to anything with the shorter proposals. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I also second on what uh, Matthew said. So it would be nice to have a, a kind of a road bed, maybe like a flow chart or something like that. So comment on uh, a few observers, uh, and depending on how much money you receive uh, and how far you go, it can get very short. If you have two transits in Chile, your money for the year is gone. Think about that. And then you still need to write the paper. So it's uh, it's also good to uh, I think when you to to think of how much money you have, how much money the institution have, also to send you there. Uh, so hi, my name is Kaylin Henderson, and I was uh, an NSF GRFP fellow to the GROW program, as uh, Laura mentioned, and I'm about to start an NPP in the fall. And so I have a couple of comments just to piggyback on, on some things that people have said kind of throughout the Q&A um, that are mostly applicable to the NPP. Um, so uh, Dan had made a point earlier about the fact that the Hubble is four pages and the Sagan is three pages, you know, so cutting, writing a Hubble and then cutting it down by a page is good strategy. Um, one fellowship that I, I don't think was mentioned at all is the NSF postdoctoral fellowship. That one's actually due the earliest and is the biggest. It's larger than the NPP. It's 10 pages single spaced, which comes out, uh, so it combines research and outreach. I should say intellectual merit and moderate impacts. And the intellectual merit component of that is actually about the same size as the NPP application uh, because those 15 pages are double spaced. And so something that's useful is, uh, especially since the, the NSF is due so much earlier, about a month ahead of time. You know, if you've written an NSF, you can essentially uh, kind of transport that into NPP form and cut out the, the broader impact section, uh, which is not an explicit requirement uh, for the NPP proposal. You know, and then from there, you know, maybe fundamentally changing to write a four-page proposal uh, is a better idea, but you can at least have a couple of different ideas if you try to cut space. Um, and there's, there's a question over here that was really related to how do you 
specific to the, the case of the NPP, how do you go about actually um, finding different peoples or searching what are called research opportunities, which uh, have been posted up there. And some advice that I had gotten from the people who ended up uh, at least being part of the, uh, the process for me at JPL was, so you have these institution-specific uh, uh, research opportunities for the NPP, and each of them has one or maybe multiple advisors tailored to them. But really, what those serve as is kind of like a job advertisement of like what people are doing at JPL. Um, you know, that's a good forum for you to search uh, and proactively, as some people mentioned, which is always a good idea, maybe contact the people who are the host advisors for these ROs and say, hey, you know, here's who I am, here's what I'm doing, I'm thinking about applying for this, do you have any tips? Are other people applying for it? Because that's something that, that can happen. Uh, you can, you know, it's good to know if you're more than one person applying for the same RO at the same NPP host site. Uh, and then they can also work with you. And, and something I was told, which other NPP can maybe comment on whether or not this is actually true, since I was part um, But that your proposal uh, for the NPP is never actually adjudicated uh, based on its ability to carry out whatever specific RO you apply to. Um, that's more of a, you, know, you find a host advisor, you talk with them uh, to set up your application, and then later, your application is just uh, adjudicated based on its own merits, not necessarily how efficacious it's going to be at carrying out uh, that specific um, And I'd be happy to answer questions later as well. And, uh, and as the post-op fellowship recently mm -hmm. went to the international, I wanted to follow up on Caleb's point about the NPP sort of advertised research opportunities. Uh, they're up to the NASA scientists, and some of them are really, really dated. So it's worth just finding out what people are actually doing now. One of the ones when I was applying for an NPP was analyzing pioneer data to help design an instrument for Voyager. In an electronic format on the so, um, so approach people at conferences, find out what they're actually doing now, and what they're doing 30 years ago, and you'll find, find a lot of opportunities. How are we doing for time? I thought I'd a long time ago. Any <coughs> more questions or comments? Yeah. For the Oakland fellowships, is it detrimental to apply your first choice host institution as your PhD institution? So I can comment on that on some of the anonymous advice I got but didn't po post. And, um, it seems that the panel members seem to be a little split on these. Um, some find it detrimental and some don't. Um, if you do, then having a, a reasonable reason why is always a good argument. And um, for, the, for those of you who have two body problems or personal problems, um, panel members said personal reasons, as long as they're reasonable, are reasonable reasons. Um, the panel members are human, <laughs> they wanted me to emphasize, so they will accept things like that. And, um, there have been cases where uh, the Hubble and Sagan, they have break, broken the one fellow per institution rule for uh, things like that. So they tell you you can't apply, but you're on the list, uh, you've been offered a position, but you need to go to your second or third choice institution, and you email them and say, I want to go here, and this is why then they may switch. This is the kind of thing you would want to say in like a private email and not in your actual application? Uh, so if, if, so if, if your uh, reason for picking such an institution, if your primary reason for picking such an institution is a personal reason, then uh, you might as well put that in your main proposal because if you could try and come up with a lame reason for why you want to stay, then that shines through. Um, if you get to the point where you've got been offered the fellowship but the place you want to go is not available, then that's the kind of um, personal email you'll send to the, the program coordinator. We were told this at the Hubble Symposium. Um, I don't know why they're telling the wrong people. <laughs> um, perhaps so we can pass the information on to you guys. But, um, that's, that's the, the advice I have. 
Yeah, to, to add to that as well, the, the proposal asks you to uh, justify your choice of any institution. Um, but I think if you are, if you have got a good reason to stay somewhere, like I, I did a postdoc at Ohio State and I took my ticket to Ohio State, I, I made sure I had a really good reason, written really well explained in the proposal why I need, why I needed to stay. Um, but even if you're going somewhere else, you should you should still have a really good reason for wanting to go there and above. I did. I, I was just going to say I did the same thing. I, I took uh, Hubble to my PhD institution, um, and you just have to put it in your proposal that you know a very good reason on why and how it's not going to like hold you back from doing really awesome science. Um, I want to add to uh, Daniel's point about getting to, for the MPP to um, get to know the sponsor or the advisor beforehand because uh, the sponsor is supposed to uh, assess your proposal beforehand and that takes about 20% of the total stuff. I'm not going to offer a little bit of financial advice for MPP fellows from experience. They don't tax you the same way they do for other postdocs. And you're going to have a big bill at tax time if you don't pay your tax bond. So, <laughs> avoid the mistake. <laughs> um, in addition to the obvious postdocs that have been discussed, there are, especially if your skill set or your interests are in, in directions that touch on other fields, there are postdocs uh, that go on and see astronomers, perhaps, or go on and see people that do what they do at institutions that think of things like Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the postdoctoral program that takes astronomers. If what they're doing is connected to the astronomy design of the lab. Um, uh, NCAR in Boulder, which is at the Spirit Research, will often take people or have taken people that work on the sun and sub solar like stars and that So find people, you know, think about those other directions as well, because these are uh, group paying postdocs that are not profiles, so they're not the sorts of things that are on this list, because not every astronomer can apply to them. So where do you find out about the sort of opportunity? I I found out about all of them through the great work. So an another example of this, if you're interested in living in New York, the Simons uh, Fellowship is really good. There have been two astronomers so far with that fellowship, and it's very nice, but you have to be in a New York City institution. Um, but it, it's for any physical sciences or the sciences in general. Uh, so I think it's I know a lot of postdocs who are now in industry. It seems to be easy enough. <laughs> but uh, on the note of mentioning all these other different fellowships, I just had a general question about time management. So if you're a grad student and you're kind of finishing up, you're probably going to be applying to tens of fellowships. And so you know, do you have to take a break from all the things you've been doing up until that point? Or was there some way to kind of work in your typical academic daily habits into uh, this sort of these few months where you have to start writing all these proposals. So you, you definitely have to set aside time. It's up to you whether you decide to split over several months and still do research or, or go forward in August, or you spend the entire of August. Um, in my experience, I've done it twice now, and I would say it's about a month of solid time if you want to do well. So if you want to start now, then you'll get to do a bit of research in August. If you want to start in August, um, then, then enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you should have a good idea of what project you want to propose now. And start thinking about it and start talking to people. Um, because they'll tell you, no, that sounds rubbish, or that sounds excellent, but I'd suggest this. There are no more questions. Uh, um, approach the speakers and other uh, fellowship winner to have similar experiences. Uh, you put your hands up earlier. Put them up now, actually. Do we have other NPPs and NSF fellows? And, um, say goodbye.
Deacon Fellows and Humble Fellows. Okay, so um, uh, please be available to offer your advice if people approach you. Thank you very much for the panel. Please give them.